Alrighty, episode 4 of Anime for Trash Dwellers. This week we're talking, well, 10 days, oh, we're talking about Kubo Kekihatsu Boys. Hear me out, guys. It's a reverse harem, but get this, they're all annoying shithead teenage boys. It's one of those animes that's based off of a Vocaloid song, and going off of this show, there would be a great new genre to pursue in the name of art. There is the Sentai one. He even wears a little Ultraman knockoff hat and is voiced by the voice of Deku, tips to the head of casting. There's the guy who pretends to be his OC, and uh, an otaku, and a furry. Wow, I don't know which one I'd pick. We are introduced to the new exchange student, who just wants normal friends, but instead, as soon as she steps into the classroom, is hounded by these weirdos. Because she has an eye patch on, Sentai Kun assumes she's a fucking weirdo like him. And of course, he thinks she's the pink Power Ranger, fucking sexist. And then she utters something I have never heard in an anime before I'm wearing the medical eye patch for medical reasons. It's almost like they were created for that purpose instead of being a key way into the anime character's dark past. Just gonna mention, every time one of the harem boys opens their mouths, Eyepatch either has a look of fear, contempt, or of all just being done with people's shit. Finally, a character I can identify with. It's lunchtime, everyone's avoiding her after having only one class with her because they now associate her with the weirdos who linger around her. But don't worry, another actual girl talks to her and suggests if she's struggling to make friends, well there just so happens to be a club for that. And good lordy oh lord, would you believe the people in school school who have trouble making friends are the fucking weird ones? Osikun introduces his backstory because telling this girl his name just isn't enough. Otaku-kun does the proper polite thing and introduces his 2D waifu to her, then apologises that even though he is absolutely fucking amazing, that he only dates 2D girls. Okay. There are quite a few harem with annoying fucking pieces of shit because hey, as long as they're hot, personality doesn't matter. This basic concept doesn't work in reverse harem because there is only one thing you need in order to get a girl to date you. Be nice. Not even be a nice person. Not even be nice to say girl regularly. Just be nice to her once and then ask her out because she'll feel too rude to say no. Taking this fact into account, even if this otaku is talented and hot, he is a little shithead all of the time, and therefore no girls wants to date him. Sentai-kun refers to Otaku-kun as the Yellow Ranger, to which Otaku-kun responds, But I'm too handsome for that. Exactly, he should be the Pink Power Ranger, you fucking sexist. Fairy-kun briefly comes into the club room and then exits, because he's the cool bad boy type, with cat ears and a tail. I thought the scene kids were gone, but oh well. Back to class and Sentai-kun jumps out of a second story window to deflect a rogue soccer ball and the only girl in the class who talks to Eyepatch-chan goes, Wow, isn't he good at athletics? And Eyepatch-chan just like, He fucking jumped out of the second story, he should be dead. As Eyepatch-chan exits the classroom, Osi-kun suggests she should try to meet up with people in the school she knew from her past life. And when a plastic flamingo that is a knockoff of them plastic screaming chickens is thrown at her. Why are you flamingo? Why pick a relatively silent bird over all the other noisy little burbs known in existence? But that is a running theme in this show. Weird knockoffs. I mean, if some guy was trying to have a serious conversation with me about past lives, I would be grateful for the flamingo interruption. Otaku-kun decides that since he and Aipach-chan are now friends, it's only proper and polite to introduce her to his other friends. His other friends being the other characters in the hit anime rhythm slash dating game, Live. I'm now hoping if Apple ventures into the 2D idol genre that that's what their group name would be. 
sports class. And the only girl he talks to Eyepatch Chan says, Hey, I like Vocaloids. And Eyepatch Chan responds, Oh my fucking god, me too. Now, for some reason, Sentai, OC, and Otaku kun are skipping class because they come up with the ingenious idea of making paper aeroplanes, introducing Eyepatch Chan as the pink Power Ranger and requesting that people become friends with her. Now, Eyepatch Chan's response to this isn't, guys, this is so embarrassing, but instead, oh my god, I am going to be completely ostracized from everyone and end up alone. Then a basketball hoop almost falls on her because Fairy Charm purposely pulled it down to land on her. He went from harmless shit like rubber flamingos to genuinely trying to kill her because she shouldn't use us as makeshift friends until she makes actual ones. Girl didn't even want to be near you fucking weirdos, you just kept coming after her. I never associated such angstiness with the fairy community since fursuits are gaudy as fuck, but hey, maybe I was wrong. Throughout this episode, random background characters mention how nice the hero club is, as if it's supposed to offset how irritating they are, even though one of them literally tried to kill this girl. Her eye patch comes off and oh my god, her eye is actually injured! The opening song for this show is sung terribly, so I thought maybe it's stylized like Vocaloid songs sometimes are. Then this serious slow ending song plays and oh lordy no, it's just that none of these guys can sing in an anime based off of a song. Episode 2. So it wasn't actually Fairy Chan trying to kill this girl but some fucking random we've yet been introduced to. Apparently his deal is he asked out the only girl he talks to our protag so now he's jealous of her. Really? What is it with these straight people getting mad about their crush being gay? Like, having to see her make out with another hot chick should be seen as a positive thing. The Hero Club decide that the only way to help out the girls is to get only female friend Chan a fake boyfriend as opposed to, you know, calling the cops on this kid for stalking and attempted murder. To organise this, they head on over to O.C. Chan's house, where whilst they wait for him to bring drinks, they be really respectful of his private property via reading his two Grimoire-esque looking journals. The first one is this kid's own personally made death note, which doesn't even have any names in it. Either no one is currently pissing him off, or he takes the responsibility and the levity of owning and controlling a death note very seriously. His second one is his own written manga, where he stars as the lead, and writes an afterwards stating, Hello reader, nice to meet you, but then again, we may have met in a previous life. Like... It is so weird seeing an anime rip to shreds practically half of its potential audience. He also has a pet budgie. Aussie represent! He even drags the poor bird into his fantasy world like, no child, your bird does not have to be a part's demon lord who killed you in another world. He can just be your cute pet budgerigar. After Otaku-chan has a meltdown over the idea of a real-life girlfriend since he realises it involves things you don't need in a 2D relationship, such as commitment and a decently sized penis, only female friend-chan picks OC-chan due to his compassion shown via bitch slapping Otaku-chan out of it. Only female friend-chan goes to confront her murderous stalker with Ochi-chan and the rest of the hero club following behind to make sure the two of them aren't killed by this psycho. OC-chan's dramatic entry Entrance is him standing in the rain performing a soliloquy. The three of them go clothes shopping, but OC Chan is the only one trying on clothing, and of course, he only picks out anime as jackets and boots. The whole time, only female friend Chan is understanding his stupid monologues and being nice and supportive of him. Like, I could actually see them dating. The three of them go for coffee and Osi chan explains, accompanied in the background with poorly drawn fan art, that in another life, only female friend Chan was a blacksmith's daughter. Is it a thing in Isekai that the wife was a blacksmith? He was actually an angel and his lover. We get to see his OC outfit and it's just a fancier version of Kirito's jacket. The murderous stalker who should be in prison has to go pee pee and we see him and Furry chan talking outside the toilet and I was generally surprised when Furry chan didn't follow him into the bathroom to give him a blowjob because I'm a pervy piece of shit. As he walks past Protag chan he whispers in her ear, I wouldn't stand behind me if I were you. Okay, so this kid also acts like a villain. 
Is this also a subset of the fairydom, like fairies with sonic foot fetishes that some of your first owners are also canonically evil? The murderous stalker comes back from doing a massive shit. O.C. Chan mentions his Akazic record and I'm like, this is literally stolen straight from an isekai. And I'm having trouble breathing and he is forced to pull out his death note. Everyone just freaks out since when they sneaked at it before they assumed it was something he'd be, you know, embarrassed about but no he just unironically pulls out his death note when fighting against a kid who almost crushed a girl to death with a falling basketball goal post. So the attempted murderer leaves them alone purely by being too weirded out. The episode ends with Fairy Chan evilly laughing for no reason. Oh yeah, um, for most of this episode, Protag Chan isn't wearing her eye patch anymore because her bruise is healed because that was the only reason why she was wearing it. See, for years I was like, why do you guys like me now, but they didn't like me back in high school since my looks haven't changed. And after watching this show, it's made me realise it was because I was a strange and sufferable piece of shit. Episode 3, Protect Chan is buying a drink at a vending machine and Furry Chan pops up around the corner and goes, Hey, what did I tell you about not getting behind me? And she like, hey, do you see the fucking vending machine I'm obviously grabbing a drink from? He talks to Protect Chan about what a bunch of fucking losers and weirdos the Hero Club members are. And she like, oh yeah, because you're so fucking normal. And then he explains he hates them because they act like they have powers when they don't. They don't understand the burden of actual superpowers. Oh jeez. And this girl still continues to talk to him even after a comment like that. The Hero Club decide to follow Fairy Chan around school because this show needs an introduction episode based on him. He's just like grabbing groceries and shit and when following him, O.C. Chan pulls out his Phoenix companion, aka his little budgie. He's just dragging around everywhere in this cage. The subtitles called him a parakeet. Like, could you please stop whitewashing my budgie pal, please? An Australian animal hasn't featured in anime since either Cute High Earth, Defense Club Love, or Pop Team Epic. I can't remember which one came out more recently. Because he's a shitty teenage boy who doesn't understand how to carefully look after things properly whilst he's flinging the cage around, he drops it and Burb escapes. So, a fuck fairy charm, their main prerogative has changed to finding that burb. I am disappointed to say that no one tries to capture the burb via budgie smugglers. They try first via OC charm pulling out his flute and playing it terribly. Puts that fucking titanic kid to shame. Then they need to perform a ritual to bring it back, which is done via a battle which is done via buying cheap ass cooking, cooking equipment at the 100 yen store. They have like eight items which they all break and even though that is an incredibly accurate thing for a teen to do as an adult, that much waste stresses me out. The anime decides that okay, this charade has gone on long enough and brings the budgie back so that they can capture him and oh hey remember fairy chan yeah that's what we were actually doing following him. Well since the budgie created sufficient time for a distraction he has turned up with three siblings in tow and they're in the woods looking for their cat. It was during this point that I realized the big flaw in this show. OC-chan is so much more bizarre with so much more weird shit he can do than the others that he pretty much steals it. He sees like an enemy or something and fights it. And Sentai-chan joins in and Furry-chan watches on the three of them fucking gaslighting Protag-chan into thinking she's missing out. OC-chan runs off deeper into the woods screaming and gets lost. Otaku-chan is scared and starts singing and dancing to remain calm, causing him to fall off the edge of a hill, KOing himself. The local monk finds the cat and is all mad at these brats running around and screaming on his property at 7 o'clock at night. By the way, it's basically anime Grumpy Cat. I love it. It's so mad having to be near any of the characters in this show. So, the big reveal about Fairy Chan is he doesn't actually have a first owner. <laughs> he was just always acting cool and badass and mysterious when in actuality he's a little wuss who gets bossed around by his older sisters and has to do more housework than the average teenager. Like he got a phone call and he's like, I have to go now, all mysterious. And as soon as he took it, I'm like, that's his mum. And it was from his older sister, so not too far off. Also, classic teen. He doesn't like black coffee, but he drinks it to look cool. It ends with the local monk making them clean up his yard. 
Episode 4, a new transfer student appears who's real hot so the girls are all over him and Protect Chun like, barely anyone talked to me when I was transferred, the fuck? Well my dear, that's what we call thought logic. Also, during this scene, she talks to her one normal female friend about Otaku-chan's crappy idol music, and then she goes, But Vocaloids are okay, and Protect-chan replies, Yes, Vocaloids are indeed good, not just saying that because we're in a Vocaloid-inspired anime. So the transfer student came over for America, so he talks in broken English phrases. I was hoping it'd be revealed like he's faking or whatever, but no. I think he's supposed to legit speak English. But he does carry a guitar case around that he hasn't opened yet, so you never know. They go to cooking class where you are given a main ingredient and then make a meal of your choice. Yes, this works for Iron Chef where the competitors are world class chefs. It doesn't work in a class where you're supposed to be teaching people how to cook. But it works for a great cooking tournament between the transfer student and the hero club. They even got transfer student doing the sexy salt bathing. Out of all the memes to transfer over to Japan, it's that one. Basically, it's a disaster and they ruin everything. Oh, and it's revealed that he's Fairy Chan's cousin. Just feel like if I don't mention it now, it'll come up later and I'll have to mention it anyway. So, in order to make it up to the transfer student, they decide to buy him a rare edition jello he likes that the local store only sells three of each day. This sounds like a limited edition, aka recent thing, that this fucker somehow got his hands on whilst living it up in America. Sentai Chan, Protect Chan, and Fairy Chan make it there to line up at 4 a.m. until the shop opens at 8. Protect Chan makes it clear that, oh nah, if I knew this were a 4 hour wait, I would have stayed home. Meanwhile, Sentai Chan, like, I was already up to trade! Power! OC Chan ain't there because his evil right arm plays up in the mornings, apparently. And they find out that Otaku-chan wasn't there because a special waifu-chan bus was running that day. That he only arrived at the bus stop for seconds before it arrived, instead of four hours in advance like an actual otaku. What's with the shitty writing in this episode? They get the jello, they go to school and hey, OC-chan is there and hey, his right arm is playing up. He was telling the truth and there's some actual consistency in this story. I mean, I don't blame him resisting on morning wank is hard. Transfer student is so moved by the jello and apology that he joins the hero club and Project Chun like, what? Really? You're choosing to be here? I didn't have a choice. I wanted to be with the normal people, like my one normal female friend. You still have a chance. You still have some dignity. You're actually normal. Leave. And then he says something kind of pretentious and she's like, wait a minute. Maybe he secretly is a fucking weirdo. She has a point. He is blood related to the kid in the cat ear and tail hoodie who drinks coffee purely to look cool. Episode 5. Opening shot is Protag-chan finishing a jigsaw puzzle which has printed across it peaceful life. Only so that when she answers her phone with Fairy-chan screaming in her ear, she falls over onto the table and has it fall apart, leaving the peaceful life pieces together instead of having them split down the middle in a more symbolic fashion. But whatevs. Fairy-chan calls the Hero Club together to go undercover at the local amusement park to discover why all the staff are getting sick one by one, which translates to, there's been a cold going around and they need temps. Which Project chan does in order to achieve her inspirational goal of purchasing a 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. I think this girl needs to realise no one is friends with her not because she's part of the weirdos gang, because she's bland and boring as hell. And yes, this did come out before Corona-chan hit, so this girl was just ahead of her time. Otaku-chan is sold on the idea because there's an iLive mini show on. Oh yeah, if this guy's such a huge fan of this, how come he didn't already realise this show was planned and wasn't already waiting outside 8 hours before the park opened so that he can get the best seat all decked out in his merch with his light sticks and fuwa? Honestly, I don't know if my otakus use the fuwa or if it's just a girl thing, but fuck it, he'd have one anyway. By the way, this theme park is called Amazing Land, and yep. I guess the title sums it all up. One of Furry chans many sisters is in charge of them and assigns them to their roles. Sentai-chan at the Sentai show, yes. Having an overly enthusiastic Sentai fan who could potentially ruin the show should definitely be involved. Otaku-chan at the Lost Children's Zone, ah yes. 
leave the potential future pedophile with the children. Protect Chan at some vague ass role, which means she can go between areas so that when one of the weirdos says something stupid, she's there to be the straight man. Ingress Chan and OC Chan run a food stall. I guess because Ingress Chan can cook and OC Chan is so unable to act in a socially acceptable way that he needs parental supervision wherever he goes. And Furry Chan at the cat bus since he's a furry. But not really. Anyway. At the Sentai show, Sentai-chan shows poor writing skills from the writers of this show because when the Sentai decide they need to join forces to defeat the villains, which is the climax of any Sentai show and the theme of friendship in these shows is only second to being a hard-working hero, Sentai-chan goes fuck that and just fucking goes for these cunts by himself and is surprised, as he should be, that when he ad-libs, these trained actors just are incapable of going along with it. Then he gets demoted to villain, but he still acts as the Red Sentai, and the kids are digging this plot twist, unlike before when they were feeling conflicted on whether friendship and love weren't actually more important than fucking doing your own thing. But still, these incompetent actors just drag him off the stage. And not once, not once does this kid do a backflip. He's literally done some type of great athletic feat in every episode and yet in the instance where that skill is actually useful apparently he's got better shit to do or something. Overall poorly handled writers of this show. Furry-chan. Furry-chan hate and hanging out at the kitty ride. He's that unenthusiastic employee that you aren't entirely sure if they're dying or not. And he doesn't like the hat. Dude it's a cap with caddies on it. It's as gangster as your hoodie with caddies on it. Why do you hate it? Then his sister reminds him that she doesn't even give a crap about the child abuse laws and he better to be nyan 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 in at every one of these fucking kids and wearing his hat with pride. Whenever these kids go off on their shitty little cat bus ride, he like, have fun on your dangerous ride to hell. Can't this is not Dream World on the Gower Coast, all right? This ride is safe. And by the end of the day, he yarned out. The foodie duo is selling well because OC Chan repeats the orders back in his weird OC stylized way and everyone starts attending the food stand to watch. See, in this episode where every character gets their own time to shine, OC Chan is left with nowhere near as much time and with someone else and told to share the spotlight with because he's just so much funnier than everyone else in this show. I'm telling ya, it's the moss problem. If this show goes on too long, the writer's just gonna give up and it's gonna turn into the moss crowd. He also refers to taking people's money as equivalent exchange. Finally, our first full metal reference. I see you are a man of culture. Otaku-chan, well, a lost child comes in and he's making an announcement on the intercom and then, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this child has a Wu-chan badge. This poor lost child has a new Wu-chan badge. I repeat, an Wu-chan badge. Where he sings and dances to her an Uwa chan song, which calms the child instead of creeping around and having her cry even more. There's this grizzled guy watching as he just brings in all these lost children. You mean lost or stolen, cause it gets you off. During his break, and Otaku-chan is apparently the only one who gets breaks, cause we don't see any of the other characters on their smokers. I don't know, I dig seeing Fairy-chan trying to smoke a durry in order to look cool and then end up having a coughing fit. Otaku-chan watches the live show during his break. It's just someone in a full mascot outfit of Uu-chan, cause who cares about the other iLive members, right? And he goes backstage to meet them and OMG, it's the grizzled cunt from before helping lost children and dancing as an underage girl. That should be evidence enough for the cops to check his hard drive in basement. Now, it's set up so that you'll think Otaku-chan will react in disgust, which I honestly thought he would, so I can't talk. But instead, he treats this man with nothing but respect, which makes sense when you think about it, because this is his future. This is what he will turn into as an adult. At the second show of the day, the grizzled man's done his back in, but from seeing Otaku-chan performing before at the Lost Kids Center, he knows he's up for it. It's like the writers spent all of their brain power coming up with this set off and payoff that they had no creativity left to make all the other characters act in character. Episode 6. It starts with the student council, aka three people with glasses on, saying the hero club has to go because they're little shits who are always causing a ruckus outside of school. I mean, 
They're supposed to be seen as the villains, but they've got a fair point. <laughs> I remember my old vice principal used to say, as long as you wear in your uniform, you didn't give a crap about what you did outside of school. So yeah, them boys just gotta put a hoodie on over their varying and slack uniforms and voila, problem solved. Lots of people are coming to the Hero Club to ask for help during the sports festival. O.C. Chun serves this kid up some matcha, but refers to it as Green Alexa. And this kid just like, um, yeah, I'm not putting that possibly dried concoction anywhere near my mouth, thank you very much. There's a little training montage for the sports fest, and it involves the rock, paper, scissors punishment game with the helmet and hamper. I know I've seen it in some K-pop or J-pop stars play it at some time. She's not entirely sure which ones, which O.C. Chun refers to as Thor's hammer, yes. A plastic toy hammer that does fuck all damage can be referred to as Thor's hammer. Also, during this montage, somewhere he states that he can summon others for help. Like who, your mum? Sports verse, and Otoku chans the MC, cause then he can play iLive music over the speakers. Smart move. He's interviewing the cousins and goes, Um, you're that cute stereotype where you don't realise your cousins until you're already married, except that you're both guys. Okay, one. Male cousins can still hook up with one another. We're an equal opportunity society here. And two, that's fucking creepy inbreeding. Don't think it's cute. When O.C. Chan's emceed, he gives his stupid fantasy name, and when asked how he'll go in the race, responds, I am from the darkness. I avoid the spotlight. Everything this child says is fucking gold. The race goes, and Furry Chan, who was like, Yeah, I've got really long legs, I'll be great at this race, is just average. And O.C. Chan practically having an asthma attack over here. Even when he's finished the race, he's trying to give some bullshit fantasy excuse about why he's about to pass out. During all these events, Project Chan's hanging with her only female friend, Chan. Oh good, she wasn't in the last episode and I was worried she'd finally been frightened away. And now it's time for the Borrower Thing race, which is in every sports anime and literally never happens at any Australian sports festivals. Like, it's mainly just Sentai-chan and Ingress-chan, but they added in a little bit with OC-chan, which is purely because he's the funniest and they needed to make up the runtime. He's in front of the teacher who's going, Son, you need something red, and that is not red. And he's referring to his little budgie. Not sure if I want to know if he had to smuggle his budgie into school and his budgie smugglers or not. And O.C. Chum responds, No, he is possessed by the soul of the phoenix. And somewhere in this kerfuffle, he lets go of his budgie and it flies away again. When will this child learn? Back to the other two characters competing in this, we have a it seems like he's being romantic but then is it montage between Project Chan and Sentai Chan. No! Project Chan, they're all little shitheads. You don't even want to contemplate being romantic with any of them. Yeah, the rest of the app, not too much else happens. Fairy Chan hints that English Chan's guitar case is empty, and then English Chan says something weird and lame again that makes Project Chan think, hmm, wait a second. And the Shin Cancel still thinks that they're dodgy, but yeah, not much else. Episode 7 Project Chan chillin' with her only female friend who's like, Man, you sure do like the Hero Club. You keep going back there. To which Project Chan responds, Well, I mean, they got food for him. The school council pull her over and show her incriminating photos and she's like, Yeah, see, they're just helping people. Just helping people. <laughs> and they aren't impressed. And she like, Oh no, are you going to shut down the club? And the school's like, We don't actually have the power to do that. And you're not even a club. You're just squatting in that dusty old room. How fucking weak is this council? How many anime's plots hinge on the cancellation or lack of funding from school councils? Oh, protect John at home and she's reminiscing about the club whilst doing a jigsaw puzzle. And as she's thinking about all the problems the hero club causes her, the jigsaw puzzle piece that she's putting into the puzzle just doesn't fit. I swear, I swear, I was ready to jump through that screen and fucking flip that damn table over. I thought at the time you were just being melodramatic Dom Yoji from the Japanese live action voiceover flowers, but no. 
I was wrong, Domyoji. There are indeed moments where the only way to express your emotions of pure fucking disgust is to flip that fucking jigsaw table over. She also reminisces how, because of the club, she was able to become friends with her only female friend. Completely forgetting that due to these cunts' idi idiocracy, she was completely isolated from the entire student body. If they hadn't have turned up, she'd have at least five more normal female friends, if not more. She decides to organise this club better by handing out tasks to who's most ideal, instead of the whole gang fucking turning up and causing a ruckus. Sentai-chan goes to pick sweet potatoes because whoever owns his property is too cheap for a harvester. My dad literally just hires old falling apart harvesters from his mates. You can fucking splurge on a harvester. But I mean he does cool flips that make the old people picking sweet potatoes happy. Otaku-chan walks a pack of poodles. This makes no sense because poodles are expensive dogs to keep. Just from initial purchase and due to a lot of health issues they possess, like heart problems, and this guy has eight of them and he can only afford to hire one city shitty teenager to walk all eight of them. I'm guessing poodle alert! Whilst walking them, Otaku chan saying to himself, Yeah, if I imagine that they're the toy poodle that Moe chan's next door neighbor owns, then I can do it for her. Or, you could just not be a cunt. How does that work? O.C. Chan is teaching world history, including his O.C. history, the Knights of Darkness, and the kids he's helping are like, is this on the test? And he's like, well guess what, punk? If you want help on your world history course, you're gonna learn about my made-up deep lore that is 100% not plagiarizing any anime that has come out in the last 10 years. English Chan is helping them with math being like, learn this. Memorize it in two seconds. There, you're learning it. If you didn't learn it, it's your fault for being dumbass. Then the whole building shakes and O.C. Chan immediately grabs his right arm, holding it back. I do not care what you say. He is the best fucking thing in this shitty show. It is the stampede of fangirls coming after Ingress Chan. And these fangirls, it's not your usual cute girly fangirl screaming. It's full fucking vocal cords. Punch me in the ovaries to impregnate me screaming. And he gets rid of them through the power. Power of English. He tells them to fuck off in English, then translates. <laughs> Due to this fangirl stampede, Project John just can't trust these stupid boys and decides to do the next quest, I, I mean request, by herself. Sentai Chan knows something up because he called her pink and she didn't get annoyed. Child. <laughs> if you are well aware that this girl does not like being called pink, then how about you not be a cunt and call her by her real name? Smart girl wrote it down on a sticky pad where the boys are shaded it over the imprint with a pencil. Fear now that she'd miss the last bus because the last bus would have been the Moe Chan bus they rode before. Walking back from her mission, I mean request, Protag Chan comes across a stanky old pond and that absolute unit anime grumpy cat trying to pick a fight with the cop, but it falls in. So Protag Chan goes to rescue him, inevitably falling in. I have an intense fear of swimming near fishes, so when she goes, ah, their scales are more painful than I expected, I'm just over here like, <laughs> why is this stupid anime so scary? But they rescue her, which she's grateful for, even though they didn't get there in time to stop her from falling into this rank ass pond in the first place. The episode finishes with her reminiscing, I oh, don't know no, guys, all these hot guys are weird, but I think I actually like the hero club. No, this is not the type of character development I came here for. You were right all along girl, they're shitty fucking teens, don't fall for them. Episode 8. The drama club are in desperate need of help from the hero club, as their club may be shut down since they haven't recruited enough members, to which Sentai-chan responds, Four members? That's not enough for a Sentai squad! Yeah, it was really hard to recruit new members for the hero club! And Protect chan just thinking, Yeah, it was hard having a group of boys force me to do something against my will via isolating me from everyone else around me! Like seriously, Sentai-chan, there are multiple plays they can do with four people that aren't Sentai Sentry. Calm down. They have to win the popularity poll at the school festival or else they're out! This information is all told to us through a play. 
where the one guy in the club has the part of the narrator slash cabinet slash wall. They all agree to help Otaki-chan is Snow White, Sentai-chan is Thumbelina, and Osi-chan is Cinderella, while Protag-chan, aka the only actual girl in the club, is made to work backstage. Ingris-chan was given the role of Sleeping Beauty, but he's too cool to get up on stage. And Furry-chan is the horse. And when he goes to debate with the head of the drama club why he's playing a minor role like the horse, she does the even though your role is small it is vital bullshit. But he falls for it hook, line and sinker and spends the rest of the episode acting all self-important because he is the horse. He makes multiple heads for himself including the white unicorn with a rainbow mane cliche that is everywhere. Like every non-brand children item you can get has one of these bad boys attached to it. It's so bizarre that something like a rainbow unicorn that kind of started out as a lame joke in like 2010 has just become a normalized caricature that's just everywhere. And he makes one with cheetah spots in order to make it fast. Oh dear god. For warm up, they have to do a tongue twister. And even their tongue twisters are stupid. Sentai chan does like a ninja based one. Otaku chan just says, I love I live! Or whatever the fuck their obnoxious love live knockoff's name is. And Osi chan just shouts out a really long winded attack name. It's like he's admitting how ridiculous it is. When they're rehearsing lines, Osi chan goes, I'm always wearing a human mask. Wearing a Cinderella mask will be a piece of cake. And then he proceeds to perform the role of Cinderella, but wherein she has demon powers to kill all her enemies. You tell me he is not your favourite and you are lying straight to my face. Sentai-chan fucking jumps on the middle of the stage like, What up motherfucker is this man right here, Thumbelina? Then he has trouble pronouncing the word mole, like in English. Is it racist if a Japanese animation company make a joke about a Japanese speaking character and subsequently their voice actor being unable to pronounce a word in a language they don't speak? I think it's one of those things where it's okay for Japanese people to laugh at, but if I do it then I'm racist. Anyway, his brain shorts out when he can't remember his line, so the head of the drama club decides that ad-libbing is okay. They wake him out of his brain shortage via listing off Sentai shows and him receiving the stats for them. Now that's just a little bit too much like Deku. Oc-chan's the one who's supposed to be ripping off every anime from the last 10 years. Otoku chan takes them to the sound guy in the sound school sound studio and I'm like why is he friends with the random sound guy? And then when they're fucking around on the sound body like put an I live song in during this part and I'm like oh okay. He fucks the sound guy in order to promote his waifu. This makes sense. Protag chan's looking through the sound club CD collection and she's like hey you have lots of vocaloid stuff. And he's like ah yes Michelle I do because I love vocaloid and you in the audience can too with this Vocaloid CD pack starting at just $19.99 a month. And they start talking about an online artist who streams on Nico Nico. I love how all the subtitles had an asterisk explaining what Nico Nico is. Who the fuck is watching this trashy super niche show that doesn't know what Nico Nico is? I'm sure if you're a diehard Vocaloid fan to the extent that you'd watch this garbage, chances are you've watched plenty of Vocaloid covers on Nico Nico. And Ingris chan acting all weird when they bring up this kid, and the whole episode he's been talking about being your true self. So. Protag Chan does the audience the favor of looking up one of the streams and it is like it is English Chan. The fact that no one has watched these videos and not realized it's him makes them all complete fucking idiots. Seriously, all he covers up is a single eye. This is Superman slash Clark Kent levels of misrecognition. And then he starts off by saying in a sultry voice how much he loves us and is going to make us move. Project Town literally spitting her coffee out of this. I mean, look, if you guys dick out, maybe I would spin out my coffee, but that alone, I don't know. And he's dressed in like a glitzy zebra striped fedora and he's wearing a silver scarf and a long flowing black jacket. And he just ditting around on his camera. Dancing is not the right word for this, so ditting it is. While singing really off key, I love this child. 
Protect Chan mentions the song is good, so I'm really hoping he doesn't write his own songs. Like, you can't have him be so embarrassing, but then actually be good at one part of the production process. He has to be bad at all of it. Anyway, this episode ended as a two-parter, meaning I didn't even get to see any cross-dressing in this episode. Episode 8, The School Festival! Their classroom is running a cafe and these girls are going on about how cute Otaku-chan is. Okay, so he is canonically hot. I mean, this was also kind of established last episode, but regardless. Then they're playing Sentai theme songs and High Life songs, and the bitches in the cafe are like, Man, these songs are really geeky. And Project John just thinking how she didn't really used to like High Life songs, but now she doesn't mind it because she knows the lyrics now. I'm pretty sure knowing the lyrics to a rip-off Love Live song would be tragic to say the least. If anything, it should turn her off the song now. Then Fairy Chan appears like, hey, wanna go look around the school festival together? And Protag Chan like, why? And then he has to make the, oh, I'm just snooping out the competition bullshit excuse. Boy, we know! OC Chan's classroom is doing a haunted house and the walls are just covered in paint and newspaper. This is generally stressful to look at. That is so much future cleaning right there. He has two lit candles tied to his head. I don't care. His scalp will eventually catch on fire. Furry Chan is advertising the play by telling everyone there's a handsome horse in it. Like, mate, sure. It'll pull in a bit more of an audience, but it'll be the wrong audience. The three boys in drag are cute. Well, at least this episode was worth watching. When Osi Chan's addressed as Cinderella, he states, I am from a dimension that transcends gender. Like, you put that LGBTQI friendly fanfic out there, high chances it'll become a Cartoon Network show. That attempted murderer from the second episode is back, and he sees Osi Chan's in the play, and he sabotages it via holding an impromptu concert. Compared to him attempting to kill a 16 year old girl multiple times, this evil scheme is pretty tame. Sentai Chan ready to run out and face him and the drama club president's like, oh my god, we spent so much time on your makeup and outfit, don't you dare! And English Chan sees there's only one thing he can do. Goes to the broadcast club, dressed as his streamer self and sells the shit out of that play with his seedy voice and random English words and phrases, which he uses to narrate the play as well. There are a couple of moments in the play where something on stage that is supposed to be funny but really isn't happens and the audience laughs, happens. It's painful. It's like this show is a cringe humour show, but when their cringe humour doesn't fly, it's just flat ass comedy. During the play, the horse is just by the edge of the stage and doesn't say or do anything. This is hilarious, but they could have just added him in as a princess since it's all impromptu, so it's funny but unnecessary. When they win the most popular event at the festival, OC Chan is crying, and when Protag Chan asks him he, why, he's like, It's my magic leaking out. It's crystal tears. It's a real medical condition. Protag Chan confronts Streamer Chan, and we see that his outfit is what he hides in his guitar case. Why was he bringing his outfit to school when he desperately didn't want people to find out who he was? Did he just get dressed up and pose in bathrooms when he got bored? Did he hold impromptu concerts out of sight of school? I don't know. Also, if he lived in America, how did he stream at a time when Japanese teens would actually be awake to watch it? He confesses to Project Time that people just don't understand his avant-grand rock and roll. It's shit. That's the word you're looking for, mate. Shit. He states that when he grows up he wants to be a musician, but if that doesn't work out then he'll be a neat instead. So what you mean is is that you'll be a neat when you grow up. I'm sure your parents will be glad to hear that. He has decided to act like his real self at school. Except we see his real self is talking kinda seedily to girls when they ask him to dance. Time and place for real self. Read the situation better. Protag Chan points out to OC Chan that his eyes are still red from crying and he responds, They're red from my eyes burning with passion. Fairy Chan goes to ask Protag Chan to dance and she like, cunt. I am finally spending some time with my actual female friend after having spent the whole day with you dickheads. Read the situation better. Episode 10. It starts off with Protag Chan actually considering fobbing off her only female friend for the hero club dickheads. Bitch, 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 please. The school council finally closed the hero club for the stupidest reason. 
they brought a rando into the school. This is a great reason to cancel a club, except the rando is Shumachan in his little performance gear. So they don't recognize him, even though only like one of his eyes is covered up. How could you not recognize him? And they ask Project Chan who he is, and she's like, No, I can't break my promise to him of hiding his identity. Even though last step he decided to act like his actual weird streamer self at school now, so what's the point in hiding it? There are like three different reasons this whole shutting down the club doesn't work. OC Chan suggests that they stick it to the man, which means the other members come to school in fake pompadours, whilst he arrives in a full fucking set of night armor. Knights work for the man. I do not understand how this child's brain works. Someone finally brings up that the cat ears on Fairy Chan's hoodie makes him look like a cute cat girl, and he acting like the thought never crossed his mind. They're hanging out after school and one by one leave for the day. I see Chan like, I better leave before my third eye awakens. Let me tell you, I have no idea what that means, and I know OC Chan doesn't know either. Streamer Chan tells Otaku Chan that a new single by his wife who was going to drop in half an hour, and Otaku Chan is generally surprised to hear this news. What kind of fake fan is this guy? There is, what I am assuming is an escaped zoo animal roaming the school, and OC Chan runs into it after school whilst he's just roaming the woods with his budgie because that's just what he does when there's no hero club. And his budgie shouts out something like, Eternal Blizzard! And OC Chan shouts, No, that's a forbidden spell! It must be used with caution! If it's such a rare thing to use, why the fuck would you teach your bird to say it? All these sports club members ask Protag Chan if Sentai Chan can help them, and one of them is wearing these long fingerless gloves, high socks, a singlet, and little running shorts. Like, so stylish. Sign me up for that club. I'll just find out what the actual sport is later. The guy from the theme park app is hired to perform in an after school program or something, and the drama club makes his waifu chan suit, and it is this horrifying mess with stitches all across the face. How are the children not running away with tears streaming down their faces? And throughout the whole lair, Protect Chan finally gets to spend some time with her actual only female friend, just to spend the whole time complaining about the hero club being closed down. How fucking ungrateful are you? The first half of the series, you hated hanging out with these little schmucks and were devastated that you couldn't spend time with your actual real female friend. And now you just got it that you're just sitting there pining for dick. After reading over the writing for this episode, this is definitely the weirdest what the fuck episode to date. Episode 11! There's a secret meeting where all the school clubs decide they'll keep using the hero club in secret, and Project China is genuinely surprised to find them there. Bitch, their disguises were. From least to most obvious, Fairy Chan in a small black eye mask. Yes, this is the least obvious. OC Chan in his nine armor from last ep. Otaku Chan wearing a mask of his waifu's face. Sentai Chan has just pulled his fucking Ultraman hat down over his face. And Streamer Chan has a small metallic monocle thing over one of his eyes. How the fuck did you not recognize them, girl? You see Sentai Chan pull a sneaky with that kinky sports club guy from before and he asks for his help in the relay. Ah, he's a runner. That means he also has wear a nipple tape. Nice. There's another attack from the obvious escaped animal from the zoo and the hero club meet up with other club members to sort this shit out. Oshi Chan straight off the bat like, hmm, is this Nalathrotep? Maybe he was sent by Cthulhu or the Deep Ones. Fucking blatantly plagiarizing HP Lovecraft, the cheeky cunt. Mind you, I kind of assume his copyrights ran out, so free reign! Maybe he did pick the right one to knock off for once. Plus, Lovecraft was a super racist against Asians, so Boyo got that racism free pass card to treat Lovecraft however the fuck he feels. Then Streamachan responds with the Cthulhu based Moe anime, and everyone else in the room is like, ah, we understand now. At this point, Otaku-chan pulls an SSR card of his waifu, and I feel him in that excitement. But it's out of nowhere, and I feel like the writers for the show went, Shit. (laughs) 
We have a character where a large amount of his motivations and personality are based on him playing on that not love life gacha game. And we haven't had him pull an SSR card of this girl. And just fucking chucked it in late in this later episode with no build up. So that, hey, at least it happened. As they head off to face what probably is isn't a Lovecraftian villain. They pass the school president and he thinks they just doing normal stuff. Then he goes, hang on, that kid who's way more hilarious than the other members was carrying a tacky anime merch sword. They go to the school pool to catch this fucker. And there's mosquitoes out and O.C. Chan like, yeah, it's due to global warming that they're out now during winter. I think Sentai Chan mentioned it to me before. This sounds like a throwaway line, but this is already more environmentally conscientious than weathering with you, which had the message, my waifu is more important than global warming. They finally get to the pool to catch the fucker and oh my god, it's a penguin. I probably should have guessed that from the fact that fish were missing and it was attacking people near the pool. So this stuff ups on me. They do the right and responsible thing of calling the police, rangers, and local zoo, aka professionals, to come and safely, that's the word, safely capture this animal. Right? (laughs) Of course they don't do that. Mind you, one time I saw a massive dog roaming the streets at night, and when I called the cops, they said, call the council. So I called the council, and lo and behold, they were closed, and therefore not answering their phones, leaving this fucking dog at risk of getting hit by a car. So yeah, maybe calling the professionals for help wasn't an option, but no one even tried or contemplated that. In the process of trying to catch it, O.C. Chan falls into the pool and finally explains his deep backstory as to why he can't swim. Which is because he ate the devil's fruit. No, no, no. It's because of the poor learn to swim programs in Japanese schools. Apparently, I could be wrong on that though. When they pull him out of the pool, he gives Sentai-chan the power to say his forbidden eternal blizzard force spell. They come up with the grand master scheme of capturing the penguin via making so much noise they fucking scare the shit out of it. Protag-chan has, unfortunately for all of us watching, decide to play along with these decade stupid games and calls out unironically eternal blizzard force. Then a massive swell of water shoots out from the pool I'm not sure if it's supposed to be their imaginations or if this bitch shouted so loudly a fucking whirlpool formed. They get a certificate in the school assembly for endangering this penguin via engaging with it with no fucking animal handling training at all. And they do a swapsie so instead of getting the shitty participation certificate, they get to open their club again. That's that. Well, that was terrible. The only good character was O.C. Chan and the rest of these poorly written fuckers and scenarios sucked. That's that episode. If you listened, you listened. Don't know why. Okay, bye now.